an orangutan about food. <laughs> so everything for them is food. So here are a couple of them. Here you can see them in the food obsession. This is a place that gave them um, um, provisions. This is Camp Leakey in Central Kalimantan that grew to Galdicus, uh, operates if any of you know that name. So here's somebody making sure she gets enough to go away with. Most of the time they're stuck with the little flowers and, and nasty little fruits in the forest. Okay? Now I went out to study intelligence, and I, I think everybody's probably got a fairly intuitive sense of what I mean by intelligence, but I thought I'd just mention a few of the things that are particular about the way a psychologist might do it, or at least this psychologist did it. First of all, intelligence, as I'm talking about it, is a quality of individuals. So I'm trying to see about how any one person or any one individual, non-human person, goes about solving problems and making their way in the world. Uh, you could certainly study intelligence by looking at brains, but mostly we do it by looking at behavior. So you judge someone's behavior as a way of judging whether they're fairly smart or not. In general, uh, behavior that is learned or voluntary, that's behavior that you can control by choice, is considered more intelligent or reflecting intelligence, whereas re behavior that's reflective or instinctive wouldn't really be considered <coughs> very intelligent. We also consider that the more flexible behavior is, uh, the more intelligent it is, whether, whereas if it's real or rigid in form, we tend to think it's kind of stupid. And my example of that is, uh, comes from my cat, for example. If you've got cats or dogs, you know, when they urinate outside, for example, they'll often dig the ground around the area where they peed. When my cat does that inside in the litter box, she sometimes gets out of the box and scratches the floor as if there were dirt there. Now, it makes no sense. Mm -hmm. She doesn't seem to be able to change her behavior because the situation has changed a So that's what I mean by rote or rigid. She doesn't seem to be very sensitive to changes in conditions and alter her behavior accordingly. And the more you can be sensitive to those changes and adjust the behavior you do, the more intelligent we inclined, be inclined to think you are. And finally, the quality of your learning. All kinds of species learn, so it's not unusual to learn things. But if you learn more rapidly, if you can learn something in three trials and somebody else takes 350 trials to do it, you probably think the one who learned it more quickly is more intelligent. If your learning is generalized, that is, you learn something, you can apply it all over the place, or you can take a principle and learn a principle and apply it generally, we tend to think that's more intelligent. And if you learn at higher levels, so if you can learn principles, constructs, uh, concepts or abstract ideas rather than just concrete facts, we tend to think you're more intelligent as well. So I was looking for all of those qualities in orangutan behavior. Why did I pick orangutans? Well, I'm a lot interested, again, in species that can outsmart humans. So I'm very interested in anything that other species can do that comes close to the kind of intelligence that we see in humans. So I'm interested in ways we can get species that have similar levels and similar kinds of intelligence. Humans are primates, so that's the first clue that you take. Great apes, orangutans being the great apes, or one of the great apes, are also primates. And in fact, among the non-human primates, great apes are the primates that are the closest to humans. We share a recent common ancestor in the most recently. There are no other species in the world that are that close to humans. Therefore, orangutan intelligence and intelligence of other great apes should not only be the closest to ours among non-human species in terms of probable levels, but also in kind. For example, you, you can also think of dolphins and parrots as being extremely intelligent, intelligent, but they live in very different kinds of environments. So dolphins probably don't think the way that humans do, even though they're very smart. Great apes are a very close relative, so they probably also think the same way that we do, um, and differences are probably more like uh, differences in level. So they are the species that you want to look at if you're looking at a challenge to what we're like ourselves. If you want to look at just how close we are, I might say it's only physical appearance, but you know, in fact, if you read those expressions, they read the same way. Those expressions not only look the same, they mean about the same thing. And it's not a fluke. When you do genetic studies, it turns out that chimpanzees share 99% of their DNA with humans. Orangutans are at 97%, which is pretty close. In fact, we who work with primates like to say it the way around. We don't say chimps are 99% humans. We say humans are 99% chimpanzee. Okay. Now, there's also this fellow. Now, what is that? Kindly, kindly old gentleman? That human? Not human? How many for human? Yeah. It's an orangutan. 
that's a near adult or a young adult Sumatran orangutan. It's a photograph, I don't know how long ago it was taken, probably in the 1920s, from the American Museum of Natural History in New York. I love that photograph because that for me is the photograph that is the closest I have ever seen to an orangutan looking like a human. And just from looking at that, you can see how very close they can be. Sometimes they look very different, but there are times at which the resemblance is really uncanny. Um, and you know, again, that's just physical characteristics, but the reason they look that similar is because the whole system is similar and because we have, we share a lot of our basic makeup. So the chances are our minds are about the same too. I also study a very unusual group of orangutans. They're ex-captive orangutans under rehabilitation to resume forest life. Now the ex-captive means exactly what it says. They're orangutans that were in captivity. They were virtually all of them born wild, taken captive by killing their mothers and ter tearing them off their mothers as babies, and then they're typically sold into the illegal pet trade. They may go to people's houses, they may go to collectors, they may go to disreputable zoos or disreputable medical laboratories. However it happens, they're taken away as infants and sold off for whatever you can get. Um, they go through a very motley set of experiences, and they're a very motley crew when they show up on your door. Some of them, like this little guy on the left, uh, actually, I got one of these. Why don't I use it? Because it's not working. <laughs> this little guy on the left, uh, you can see he's dressed up, and he's very clearly being treated like a family member. So he's dressed up like a little kid. He probably sits at the table and acts like a family member within somebody's apartment. And this guy, sorry, over here on the right, uh, is a near adult male. He just looks like he's walking, but in fact, he's, he can't walk properly. He was kept in a cage that was so small that his hands and feet all atrophy. He can't open up his hands and feet, so he kind of stumbles along on his knuckles, and he can't climb. He can't ever be sent back to the forest because he basically can't move around like a normal orangutan. He can't find food by himself, so he's in terrible straits, and it's a consequence of captivity. Some other things, if you follow the news, you may know that orangutans sometimes get used in the entertainment industry. These are photographs from places in Malaysia and Thailand. There's kickboxing down here, or if you like golf, they'll do golf. If you like weightlifting, they'll do that. Or they'll sit for a photo op. And of course, what rehab tries to do is make that go away and help them back to something more like this. These are actually all ex-captive orangutans who are doing fairly well in the forest. They don't all do that well but some of them managed to pull it off and managed to go back and resume the life in the forest. Okay. The process, two big pieces of it. One is medical because some of these guys come in in terrible shape. They come in with TB, hepatitis, uh, lots of parasites. They come in with broken limbs. They come in uh, badly abused, scars from off burning or chains, malnourished. So the first job is medical, trying to get them back into some form of some shape of health. And the second part is the behavioral part, which is helping them learn the skills that they need to live in the forest. And there are two pieces of that. One is just learning how to identify things in the forest. But some of them have to be taught how to climb trees. You can believe, believe it, again, orangutans are arboreal. They're tree, tree dwellers. There are some of these ex-captive orangutans who don't like to climb trees. They would rather walk on the ground. And when they want to move from one tree to another, what a normal orangutan does is you climb a tree and cross the branches on the top. What these guys do is they climb, they come down to the ground, walk three feet, and climb up again. So they are very inept at forest skills. Some of them have lived in hotels in Bali or fancy, you know, fancy apartments, so they know nothing about the forest and first have to learn forest skills. They also, some of them, have never really seen another orangutan if they were taken from their mother when they were only a few months old. So some of them see another orangutan and they go, oh, I don't want to deal with that one. Uh, they'd rather hang out with humans, and they won't even pay attention to other orangutans. So it's a massive job trying to get them reoriented towards other orangutans in the forest, and then it takes them a long time to acquire the skills they need to handle that fairly well. Okay? This is an example of one of the procedures that people use to try and help them. This is a forest school that actually Boss Canada helped support for a little bit last year. These are juvenile orangutans. They're probably about five to seven years old. And they spend the night in cages because they can't even make nests on their own, so it's not safe to leave them in the forest overnight. So they spend the night in the cage, and in the morning, like going to school, you truck them down the road to a piece of forest. They bumble their way around in the woods for the day, come back at the end of the afternoon and sleep in a cage overnight. But while they're in the forest, you've got people in there who are helping them, who are supervising and picking them up when they fall down. They also learn to play with each other, and in fact, they develop social relationships that are useful there, and they also develop and learn from each other's skills for getting along in the forest. 
Okay, what about the intelligence part? I'm going to give you